today. Uh, for everyone that's uh, that's listening today, we're going to be taking a look at on creating schedules and managing tasks. Uh, so it should be a good one today. Uh, looking forward to going through some of the um, you know, different aspects of schedules that, that people are working with to organize their work. So I'm um, looking forward to that. We're going to talk about the agenda in just a minute. Uh, but as usual, I have myself, uh, Mark Wilson, here on the line, and then you also have my uh, wonderful co-presenter, Sophia Wilson. Uh, no relation. Uh, but uh, Sophie, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can, Mark. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining in. Okay. All right, so let's talk a bit about the agenda here. Um, actually, you know, I just noticed I have the old badge for the old webinar. <laughs> My mistake. Uh, but that's okay. Um, let's uh, talk a bit about the agenda. So, uh, you know, pretty straightforward today. Uh, you know, we're going to be really focusing on a couple topics. So, the first thing that I want to show and I want to talk about really quick, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, is uh, the concept of assigning staff to jobs and managing those jobs because this is something that I consistently see uh, people being you know, not really fully aware of, uh, the capability of just kind of working at the job level and it can be very useful in some cases where maybe scheduling is not necessary or um, not something that you want to do it all, all the time. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at that but we're not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, where we'll probably spend the bulk of our time is, uh, you know, creating schedules and, and using the, the the schedule grid and the Gantt chart. Uh, so you know, the process of you know, assigning staff and uh, you know, assigning statuses to the tasks, uh, looking at um, you know the different options that are within the schedule grid and you know, how you can you know build those schedules and and uh, and use the Gantt chart to understand you know where you are and where you're going. Uh, we're then going to be taking a look at managing staff availability and task lists. So just kind of general you know, task uh, management, you know, how to understand what your staff are working on and you know, when the due dates are coming up and what's overdue and uh, you know, what will soon be overdue or over budget and things like that. Uh, as per usual, uh, please do ask any questions that you might have. Uh, Sophie's going to be answering the questions in the background. Anything that you know, should or, or we can be showing on screen, we will um, you know, within topic. and. Uh, you know, we'll do our best for that. Sometimes, you know, we have a lot of questions and sometimes it's not so many. Last webinar two weeks ago, I was actually the one managing the questions myself and I was surprised by how many we can you know, came in. So, um, yeah, please uh, feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like and uh, anything that we can't answer today, uh, we'll do our best to follow up with you and provide an answer offline. Uh, and then also, as per usual, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the help sites and your skill development and the different resources that are available there. So, um, you know, keep your eye out for that. We're going to talk about that before we, we get into the, the bulk of the content here. Uh, and then the next webinar that we have coming up is on the 21st of September, uh, so two weeks from today, same bad time, same bad channel. And um, that's going to be all about alerts and permissions. Uh, so taking a look at, you know, so, I mean, this is something that, that we get a lot of questions on very consistently that, you know, at first glance, it might look like a simple topic, and you know, we weren't sure if it could take up a full webinar, and it may only just be a 45-minute webinar. But uh, you know, there are some neat things that you can do within alerts and permissions that can uh, you know save you some time so that you can do them in bulk. And you can also, you know, people sometimes are looking to facilitate workflows via alerts and permissions. You know, how can I make sure that uh, you know one person is receiving an email when a new task is assigned but they're not you know they don't have the permission to delete that task but they do have the permission to then reassign it to somebody else you know, that type of uh, workflow scenario um, it would be alerts and permissions so uh, two weeks from today uh, you know check it out and uh, looking forward to going over that one um, as per usual uh, like us on Facebook tweet us on Twitter uh, check, pin to our Pinterest board connect with us on LinkedIn uh, watch our YouTube videos and then do whatever it is that this thing is telling you to do all righty. Agenda up there. Sophie, I just want to check in. How's the screen looking? Like you're able to see my dashboard clearly. It's looking okay for you? Yeah, very bright and colorful. I, I love when you use some of these tiles, Mark. Okay, awesome. Perfect. All right, so let's let's kind of jump in here. Uh, a few few items to get out of the way, as per usual. Uh, you know, if, if you ever have questions, if you're ever looking for some quick answers when you're, you're logged into the system, up at the top right, you're going to find a question mark there, and there's a lot of different resources that are available to you here. So, you know, for example, the training site, uh, the webinars page, where you'll find links to upcoming webinars as well as recordings for uh, the previous webinars as well. So, here's the recording available for the webinar we did two weeks ago, and then here's the registration 
uh, for the one that's coming up in two weeks from now. Uh, there's also access to uh, the feature request portal. You can request new features and changes and upgrades and things like that. Uh, the contact support option. And then if you open up the training site, there's a lot of good resources here. Uh, you can look at it. Um, well, there's a few different ways. You know, One is to look at it by role. Uh, another is to look at the FP library. So for example, by role, uh, you know, you can go down and for each roles, there's relevant videos and documents and things like that. So you know, if you are, you know, let's say, look at an example, you know, if you're in accounting, here are the different resources that you know, would be, um, you know, be of assistance for you in, in managing your, your role there. Okay. So, yeah, so let's jump in. So, you know, the first thing that, um, that I'm wanting to touch on really quickly here is just the concept of, of just quickly assigning staff to things that you need done, you know, that may not require a schedule. This is something we see a lot, especially with smaller agencies, but sometimes with larger agencies as well. You know, you need something done quickly and you, know, you don't want to spend um, a lot of time creating a full schedule or you just want to assign people to the job level. Uh, so there's a few things that, that I want to show for this. Uh, one is just assigning staff to the job. And this is something that I do recommend you know, considering. Uh, if we just navigate to a jobs details page, from that jobs details page, we'll be able to see our contacts. So we can see how many contacts we have here. We'll also see the contacts button within this, you know, the contacts tab within the, the sub information bar. Selecting either will show you then a list of the contacts. By adding a staff person as a contact on a job, you'll then be able to search for that individual and they'll see that job on their my list on their dashboard. You can do so by selecting to manage job contacts. And then choose of your staff people, you know, who do you want to add in? So you can add in individuals, you know, maybe want to assign, uh, let's say, Caitlin and Leanne, or actually let's say Jeremy, to this job. We can also search for third parties, and this is very useful if you're using freelancers or outside resources. Uh, you know, perhaps I know that I'm working with uh, one of my freelancers, one of my contractors from a company called Blue Line Digital. I'm just going to search the word company, or the word blue under the company field. And that's going to show me then you know, the company name and then the different contacts. So I'm going to say that we're working with Tom here, and he is now a contact on that job. So that then allows you to see you know, who are the different contacts, the different resources, both internally and with the client as well, and then also any kind of freelancers or outsiders. And this can be useful for pulling up lists and managing lists of jobs that people are working on. So for example, I might want to see all the jobs that I then am a contact on. So I'm going to do a job find, and I'm going to say, you know, show me everything that's due between today and the next six weeks, where the job contact field equals my name. Perhaps that have a specific status, let's say just that are open, select find, and I can see that there are 10 jobs that I'm a contact on due in the next six weeks. And there's a bunch of different things that I can do here that I won't really you know, get into uh, too deeply right now, but you know, we can manage the columns and customize the list, uh, produce uh, an Excel or CSV export of the information we're looking at, uh, or choose to produce a PDF printout. And then it extends to you know, other things as well, like dashboards and things like that. So you know, it's something that I do recommend considering, uh, and maybe even a first step that you take when you open up a new job is decide you know, who needs to be a contact on that job. So yeah, now that that's out of the way, again, I do like to show that. Let's actually take a look at the scheduling. Uh, I'm going to go back to my dashboard really quickly here. Not that I really needed to, but just from the dashboard, I'm going to navigate to a job. So I opened up this job here, Halloween Savings Brochure. It's one we just added some contacts to. I'm going to navigate to that job. I'm going to add a schedule to it. Now, there are some different ways that you can go about doing things in Function Point. I'm, what I'm talking about is the order in which you create things. In this case, I have a job that I've opened, and I'm going to add a schedule to it. That's usually how most people work, and that's what we're going to look at it today. Uh, but there are some other options. You could create a schedule before you open up a job, but after you create an estimate. There's different workflow explanations for these decisions. You know, you may want to create a schedule as your first step. You know, assign the different tasks that need to be done. Estimate the hours that the tasks are going to take to be completed. Assign the people that are going to be doing the work. And all that information can then be used to generate an estimate. Uh, perhaps if you're not quite sure what something's going to cost and you want to base it off the reality of what you think it'll take to do it. 
So there's some different there's some different options in in workflow and order. We might even get in a bit to that a bit into that a little bit later um, after we create our schedule. Uh, maybe turn it into a template and, and use it for creating a new job. But in this example, you know, I have a job ready. I, I've cre I've given it a service structure, so we can see our services here, and I've given those services an estimated amount of hours, and I want that information that, to then flow into my schedule. There's some other info I put in here, including a freelancer and some outside expenses, and I want to include those in my schedule as well, uh, which is something that I'm going to do. So next, from the jobs details page, is I'm going to choose to add a schedule. Now you're going to have a few different options here. One is to use a template. Now using a template is going to fill in the schedule with a list of tasks, dates, staff people, descriptions that you have then you know, previously created a, as, a, as a template for, for that schedule. And you know, really for, you know, in that workflow scenario, having a template, it's just about how much work you've done prior. You know, if you've built out that template to have the information that you need, then you can use it for, you know, adding it to an existing job. Um, there's some work to be done with service mapping, and I'll show you that in just a minute, uh, but that is an option. In this example, we're going to keep it simple, because uh, really I want to focus on the actual schedule creation. So we're going to use the service structure from our estimate as the template for the schedule. Now, one thing that you'll see here is an option to include external expenses, and this is something I'm actually going to select. Uh, you are able to include external expenses as a part of the schedule, even though you're not really going to track time to those uh, external expenses. But they can be useful if you have, say, freelancers or outside contractors, you know, vendors, any kind of you know, external related work that you do want to have put into the schedule and you want to make someone responsible for it. I'm going to be talking a bit about how to manage that as well. From here, we'll keep everything else the same. Submit this. And we're now looking at our schedule. Now, I just want to talk about this schedule grid for just a minute and just, and just give it a bit of an overview and an explanation as to what it is that you're looking at. And, you know, this is, this schedule grid is pretty new, so it's had some, you know, some redesign recently. So, you know, even veterans of the system, you know, may, uh, you know, maybe seeing new things here, and and if you're new to the system, you know this will this will of course be brand new to you as well. But what we're looking at here from this grid on the left hand side, first of all, is your task groups and then your tasks, and we can choose to expand and collapse those different groupings. The task group is not really a task; it's the sum of its parts. The tasks themselves below are the actual items that are being assigned to people. We have description fields, and anywhere where you're going to see a field that's editable, you're going to see that grade, uh, that you know, that gray type, that um, you know, the the grade, for example, here instructions around adding tags and adding task descriptions. And we'll talk about kind of quickly editing these in just a second. From there, we then have the service, and the service is the line item from the estimate that the task is related to. Since I've chosen to create my schedule from the estimate, all of these are filled in automatically, except for my external expense. My freelancer uh, isn't mapped to an internal service because it, it never was one. If you are choosing to create a schedule from a template, all of these fields will be blank. And in order to track time, well, sorry, let me correct that. Any fields where there isn't an exact match to the estimate uh, will be blank and you may need to fill these out. So it's just something to keep in mind around tracking time. The service field does need to be filled in. We then have some information around you know, the, the details of the tasks, you know, the, the actual information around when it's due and who it's assigned to and things like that. Uh, so all of this is considered like a related block. When I edit one, they all open up to be edited. So as I select one, it's opening up that block for me to edit them quickly including who the task is assigned to, start date and due date, the status, and so forth. The status is going to default to be in draft. I'm going to talk, I want to, I want to talk just a bit about the statuses here because there's a tip that I want to provide. Um, when you're looking at the status for a task, and I'm just going to choose someone here really quickly just so I can open up that field. You'll notice that there's you know, draft, which is the default. Draft isn't really going to show up anywhere. So it'd only be used if you're creating a schedule for work that perhaps hasn't yet been gained. 
assigned and in progress are the two statuses where people will actually see them. And this is really important. So in order for someone to see them on their dashboard, it needs to be in one of these two statuses. Putting this, the task into an assigned status is useful if you want people to be able to acknowledge the task as a way of saying that they're going to work on it. If something is assigned, they cannot track time to it until it's in progress. And I have seen cases where people aren't aware of that, and they're keeping everything assigned uh, until it gets completed, and no, ta no time ever gets tracked directly to the task. Something that you may want to do, which I've actually been suggesting to agencies recently, is skipping the assigned status and putting everything into progress. Of course, it's up to you if you, know, if you use these statuses and they're important to you, uh, and you look at what's assigned versus what is in progress, then you, know, you may not want to do that. But um, you know, if you're not tracking the statuses to that level of granularity at this time, then you might want to skip the assign and put everything directly into progress. We then have the priority. Now, this is a list maintenance item. So you'll see this in the list maintenance area of the admin section, and you can go in and you can customize the value of these fields. We have the milestone dropdown. The milestones are basically a way of, uh, you know, assigning a task to a, you know, a milestone that's usually representative of some sort of event that's occurred. You know, so receiving final approval or the final review is a, is happening, or perhaps it's been delivered to the client. And those milestones will then be shown on people's dashboards when they look at the task. And you can then filter by milestone or search by milestone and things like that. Um, when you're looking at your schedule. You can also include that in the printout so you understand uh, you know, when the key milestones are showing up. And oftentimes this is related to client visible schedules. So if you are having your clients look at the schedule in some way, whether that's through the portal or, or through a printout, um, and typically if they're going through the portal, they're going to be looking at the printout anyways, then having the milestone relate to terminology that they understand is something that people will do as a way to use this field. You know, if, if the client understands when things need to be have, you know, having the final approval by and when it should be delivered to them, then you know, tagging the tasks with the milestones will then allow them to see that information in the printout that you share. And that then brings us then to a new field, actually, uh, what is well, it's called client, but um, it's related to whether or not the task is client visible. So if the client is going to see these tasks on the printout, in the portal, if you are using the client portal, they do need to be selected to be client visible. Anything that is not client visible, the client won't see. You know, a good example is I might not want them to see that there's freelancer work being done here, so I'm not going to make this client visible. I'm going to make everything else client visible, but not that specific item. So if I just want to check in, it looks like you're answering some questions via text. Anything that you think that we should address or touch on at this time? Yeah, hey Mark, thanks for checking in. Um, there actually is one really good question from James. I, I was just typing it out, but I think it might be worth showing on screen. Um, it has to do with the statuses that you were just touching on. Um, and his question was, why don't assigned tasks show up in the timesheet window? So um, that, that, that's a really good question. Uh, to actually have it appear in that drop down on your timesheet window, it has to be in a, in a status of in progress. Uh, that's just a way of, of just signifying that, that your staff are aware of, of this task and are ready to start work and tracking time to it. Um, and, and then it will appear in that drop down. But um, Mark, I'm sure you have a, a much better way of explaining it. No, no, not at all. Uh, you know, that was really good. And, and uh, thanks for the question, James. You know, that, that does relate specifically to you know, that comment I made around um, you know, this is something that I see oftentimes with you know, smaller agencies where um, you know, maybe there isn't, a, or, or not necessarily smaller agencies, but perhaps maybe smaller schedules where there isn't, you know, this kind of you know, long time span of work being done where a lot of it isn't active. Uh, but really, you know, a sign is showing up on people's dashboards, but they, they're not actually able to do anything with it. They can't track time against it. It isn't being worked on and, and saying that, hey, they've acknowledged this task. Uh, so yeah, I've seen that a lot, actually, on people's dashboards is you know, people not being aware that you know, if a task is assigned, they can't track time to it. So they're just tracking time directly to the job and just kind of ignoring the task. You do need to put it from assigned to in progress. And that's why I've actually been recommending to some agencies recently to skip that assigned
status and move it directly into progress uh, for all of your tasks. And that actually touches on something that we are going to be looking at today, and that is bulk editing. Because there's a lot of things on here that can be bulk edited that you may not want to go through and do one by one. And I am actually going to build out this schedule here because I want there are some things that I want to show. And I was contemplating before the webinar as to whether or not I should you know have a you know have it pre-created, but I didn't want to do that because I wanted to show the actual process of creating the schedule and talk through some of the items um, you know as we're as we're going through. So let's actually go ahead and start to build this out here. Now I'm going to move pretty quickly so I can enter some dates and things like that. Uh, but let's say, for example, that our research work, we're going to have it done by Darren, and we're going to have him starting this today, and we're going to have him finish this uh, by Friday. That's actually the sketches and rough, sorry. Uh, and I'm actually going to leave the status, because I'm, I'm going to edit that later in bulk, so I'm not going to adjust it now. I'm going to leave it in draft. Priority and milestone, I'm also not going to fill that in. Priority, I might edit in bulk later. Uh, and put them all to you know regular or then maybe ad adjust a couple uh, specifically and put it to high. I'm going to leave that for now. And milestone, I'm not going to tag this task with a milestone. So everything that you do will save when you move away, but there is this button here. It's more so to let you know that there are things that aren't saved. So as I click down below, that information is saved. So notice that it's filled in and hasn't gone anywhere. So it's easy for me to, to move quickly through this and build out the work that needs to be done. Now let's say that the design work needs to be split up. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to build the schedule today is because I wanted to show some of the methods of, of doing these types of things. Um, so let's actually close that out and then look at the design work. And we have you know this design work here that has 15 hours in the budget. And we're going to break this out into two tasks. And you'll notice that there's some buttons here. Um, so I can copy the task. I can also add an item below it just by clicking this plus icon. If I click the plus icon, I get a new task directly below it. I might call this the design you know, stage two or whatever information is important to me. Save that, I now have my second task. There's two other things that are very important to do right away when you're breaking that item down into multiple. The first thing that you want to do is you want to relate it to the service that this task should be related to. So I happen to have a service here called design. Of course, I'm going to relate it to that service. The, the service structure for your agency may not be as cut and dry as mine. It might not be as obvious. It might actually be significantly simpler. You know, I was working with an agency just the other day that had uh, you know, everything tracked to a single line item called, uh, I believe it was like agency services. or and everything that they do is tracked against that single line item. All their tasks are tracked to that line item, but their schedules are actually a bit more complex. But you want to map that service? Down to 7.5, and I'm going to move the other one to 7.5 as well. And I now have you know, two, two tasks here, design and design stage two, that are you know, both related to the design service, and are both both have 7.5 hours. It's pretty quick and easy to do that. You know, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit so I can explain my steps. But you know, you click the plus icon, select the two drop downs, and then you can go ahead and start to build out the rest of your schedule. So we're going to have this design work here done by Sean, and we're going to have him starting this on Monday, and we're going to have him finishing that, let's say, a week later at the end of the week. We're then going to have design stage two, and notice I'm just selecting down. Um, you know, not not taking a, a lot of time there, and I'm going to assign this one to Thomas, and it's stage two, so I'm going to have him starting this work on the 19th, and he's going to be finishing that on the 22nd. All the other information is entered, so I don't need to go over and adjust anything. I already have the hours in there. I'm just going to add in a few more dates so we have them, and then we're going to talk about our, our client management and our freelancer management. Uh, so let's say our copywriting here is going to be done by our copywriter, Jeremy. And he's going to be starting this on the 26th. So he's going to work on this after the design work is done. Let's say actually the 23rd, and he's going to be finishing that on the 29th. The hours are already in there. We'll save that. And then lastly, for this service group for specific work uh, is our production. And we're going to move this to Trupti. And we're going to have her working on this from the 30th until the 5th. 
So we then have a couple items that I get a lot of questions on quite a bit. You know, client management and freelancer, you know, how do you kind of organize these different things? Client management, you might actually build this out to represent you know, the different stages of the different client related deliverables. So perhaps there's like a major client related deliverable, like a client approval. So I'm going to choose to edit this. I'm going to call this a client approval. Now after the design is done, the copy is done, and the production is done, we're going to send this to the client for the first round of approval and any revision requests. So we're going to call this task client approval. We're going to assign this task to the person who's responsible for getting the approval back from the client. So I'm going to put that to the creative director. I'm going to choose Chris here. And I might not need a start date for this. I just need an end date, just the date that it's going to be happening. And I know that I need that client approval by the 10th. So by the 10th of October, I need the client to be approving that. I could also put a time of day. You know, I could say you know, 5 PM if I wanted to, and that'll fill in. Uh, so on the 10th of October, by 5 PM, I need client approval, and Chris is responsible for this. Furthermore, this is a very high priority item. And it's related to a milestone of, in this case, final approval. And we'll, in Client Visible, I'm going to bulk edit that in just a bit. So that is our client-related item. We're assigning it to the person who's responsible for getting the information from the client, and assigning the appropriate milestone and priority, and giving it the appropriate description. The freelancer is going to work in a similar way. I'm actually going to move it up. I'm going to move it above the client approval. Notice I'm just selecting the dots, dragging it up, letting it go, and I now have the freelancer then above the client approval. I'm noticing here that I have this research task. It's down below. I'm going to say I actually don't need this. So I'm just going to select it, and I'm going to delete that item. But I have my freelancer, and I have my client approval. The freelancer is the one that's still blank. It's going to work in a really similar way. Something that you probably want to do, though, is you're going to want to add in a description representing who this freelancer is. So in this case, we're working with Blue Line Digital is our you know, uh, subcontractor's company's name. So we're going to save that. So that's letting the person know. From there, we are then going to assign it to an individual. So we're going to say that the project manager, uh, let's say uh, Trupti here, is going to be responsible for liaisoning with that freelancer. And the service that she's going to be tracking to, in this case, we're going to put the time into client management. We could have put it into anywhere. We could have had a service specifically for tracking time related to that, or we could have you know, just put it into production. In this case, I'm just going to track it into the client management time, time bucket. The client approval, I have here 10 hours for client management. I don't really need to have that time there. I'm going to give Chris 2.5 hours to finish this. And then for the freelancer time, I'm going to put that up to 7.5. So we're spreading that time out a little bit. From there, I might also manage a priority uh, and put it a date. So in this case, you know, the freelancer time doesn't really matter when they're doing the work from, let's say, roughly the middle of the month until about the, uh, let's say, the, the start of October there. We might also want to tag this with a milestone. Uh, if we have a milestone related to a freelancer, uh, maybe it's a high priority as well, just to make sure that we are you know, staying on top of that freelancer. We then have our photography items, and, or sorry, our, our external expenses like photography and printing. You know, again, it's a very similar way as anything that's external. You know, really, it's just about you're selecting the appropriate service. So this is going to go into, let's say, production for any work that needs to be done for that. We need this work due, you know, finished by a certain date. It doesn't really matter when it starts, but we need this done by the 13th of October, if the client approves it all, that is. I'll actually push the photography back a little bit. And then assign it to the person responsible for liaisoning. Now you'll notice that this kind of search field is getting a little bit small as I get down to the bottom of the page. And I'm scrolling through it is getting annoying for me. So I'm just typing in the person's name into, this, into the, the assign to field, and it's pulling it up for me. And that is then my schedule created. You know, we've gone through the process of adding dates to everything. It's a full and complete schedule. So there's a few things that we're going to take a look at from here. Um, we're going to look at the Gantt view to understand you know, how things are overlapping and how they relate to each other. 
We're also going to look at the bulk edit view, where we're going to make some changes to statuses uh, and uh, perhaps a few other items as well. So if you just want to check in, anything that you think that we should uh, you know, address on screen at this time? Hey, Mark. Yeah, thanks Thanks for checking in. Uh, you know what? The questions are coming in fast and furious right now, so I, I do apologize, everyone, if I'm uh, a little slow on the reply. Um, there was another good one from James that I think might be a, a, a good one to address. And actually, James, you have so many questions. I'm thinking we might need to take this one offline and, and really tackle everything with you. Um, but this good one that he had was, um, how does he ensure the number of uh, estimated hours on their tasks are in line with their estimated hours on the estimate itself. Do you have any recommendations or best practices on that, Mark? Yeah, you know, that's a good question, and, and it's not something, you know, it's, it's a common question, and it's not something that there's really a perfect solution to uh, in a single screen, uh, which is not really the answer I'd like to give you, but it is, you know, the reality of it. What I would recommend doing um, is to actually open up the job and perhaps a different tab or a different window. And you'll notice I just hovered over jobs, hovered over view, right clicked on the job name, in this case opened it up into a new tab. I have two monitors. I usually recommend people have two monitors, um, especially with everything these days being browser based and things like that. Uh, so I'd usually pull it out, I'd move it into my other monitor. In this case, of course, we're just looking at the one. But I look at that in my financials tab. And this is showing me you know, my different hours for my different services. And, you know, it's something where if you have multiple people going in and, and, and collaborating on a schedule, then it can get a little bit tricky. I find if, if you're just creating it yourself, it's pretty easy to you know, kind of keep track because you're not really making changes to hours without putting them into other places. So, you know, when I split up the design hours, you know, I didn't just, you know, kind of, you know, do, do part of it and then come back and do the rest. You know, I'm I'm doing it all in one go, so I know there's 15 hours. And I know I'm splitting it up correctly, so that I have my seven and a half and seven and a half. Uh, but you know, having this open here is a way of of seeing that hour information to know what my estimated hours are for those services. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so let's take a look at our Gantt view. So I'm going to select Gantt now on the right hand side here. And if by any chance you can't see my cursor right now, it's probably because the GoToWebinar panel is blocking it, something I had someone tell me a couple weeks ago. Um, there, there is a, a little button, a little orange button, on the very top left of the GoToWebinar panel to you know, minimize it. It's an arrow pointing to the right. Uh, so if you can't see my cursor right now, it's probably because of that GoToWebinar panel is blocking it. I had a few people tell me that recently. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'm going to select Gantt View, and that's going to show me the Gantt View of my schedule. So there's been a few uh, changes, few updates to this since the last time we did a schedules and tasks webinar. Uh, just some minor things. You know, this this is still kind of in its infancy, and there actually are some new upgrades as well. I'm going to I'm going to talk very briefly about in just a minute. Uh, but here we have, well, first of all, uh, the today's date is highlighted, so we're able to see today's date and understand where we are, you know, very clearly. So that's a bit of a change. Uh, furthermore, up on the top left within this within this grid view, there the, the Gantt view I should say, uh, is a button that says monthly view. If we select this, we can switch to a monthly view of the Gantt chart. Uh, this is something that a lot of people were asking for because they had you know larger schedules where you know, looking at it in the weekly view, you know there were there was too much scrolling going on. Uh, so you can switch to a monthly view, and things will kind of condense down, and we can see how that breaks out over the months. We're going to look at it in the weekly view today, for example, uh, and we can see you know each of the different tasks, uh, you know the details of the task, the status, and then how they may or may not overlap with each other. Now, I'm just thinking what we're going to do here is actually before before we start getting into some of the other aspects of the Gantt chart, I think we're going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to jump back to the bulk edit. We're going to do some bulk edit work, and then we're going to come back here into the Gantt, and we're going to look at some of the dependency items. So we're going to create a couple dependencies between these tasks, and then show how they will visually be represented on the Gantt chart related to the dependency, so you can understand what the dependency is. So let's actually go to the bulk edit, and I'm just going to go to the grid view first really quickly. I didn't need to do this, but I just wanted to start here because usually you'd be in your in your grid view, and then up at the top we're going to select bulk edit. 
Now, when you select this, it changes the interface a little bit. It, it brings you into the bulk edit mode. And there's a few things that you can do. Uh, one is I'm going to move all of the task statuses. Notice how I have everything in draft. So everything's in draft. I'm going to select up at the top here to put it all into progress. Now, James, this, re this relates to your original question you asked earlier you know, near the start of the webinar around the assigned versus in progress status. Uh, there's been a couple of cases recently where I've been telling people just skip a sign, put it all into progress, unless you want your staff to be, you know, acknowledging the task, putting it into progress. Maybe that might trigger an alert for you. You know, if there's some different workflow options you're trying to facilitate with those statuses, uh, then by all means, do use that. Otherwise, in this case, I'm going to choose to put it all into progress. And I might do a couple other things. Maybe I'll adjust the priority. In this case, I'm going to leave that. Uh, now, any unsaved changes will be in blue, so I'm going to choose Save and Continue. A few things I want to touch on here while we're on this page is that we can select subsets of tasks. So I can select some tasks and not others, and then make bulk edits. So for example, if we used a schedule template to create the schedule, and the services didn't match up or weren't connected to the services in our estimate for the job we, that we're working on, we can also bulk edit the service option. And that's something that can be really useful so you don't have to worry about, about it while you're creating your schedule. You go ahead and you create your schedule, open up bulk edit, assign all the tasks to a specific service. Another thing that we can do is we can shift dates from here as well. So if I want to adjust dates, and I'm going to leave the dates on this, but if I want to adjust the dates, then I can adjust the entire schedule or, or just part of it by, by uh, doing the, the, the sub-select. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to save the changes, but maybe I move this to two weeks from today and select adjust dates. It will move all the other dates in the schedule forward by an equal amount of time. We can also adjust it based on the due date as well. So if you have a you know, schedule template and somebody says, hey, you know, we need this done by the 1st of December, well, I can adjust dates by the end of the schedule, select the 1st of December, adjust the dates, and my template is telling me in order to finish this by the 1st of December, we would need to start it by the 26th of October. So you can use the bulk edit date changes to get an understanding of you know, what those date edits uh, might look like, you know, what they would result in. So let's jump back into the, into the Gantt view here. And we're going to make a couple changes. You know, one is that we're going to add a dependency between a couple tasks here. So for example, we have design, and we have design stage two. Now design is ending on the 9th. It's a Friday. You'll notice how the weekends are highlighted, and I'm not using them. And then design stage two. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong task. Sorry about that. Uh, we have design ends on the 16th, and then design stage, stage two starts on the 19th. So I want to make the start of this task dependent upon the completion of this task. So what I'm going to do, and I can click on either one, but in order to do so, I'm going to select, in this case, Design Stage 2. What I do from the Gantt view, it is going to open up the task in a separate tab. What I would usually do is I'd pop that out. I do a lot of tab work, not just with Function Point, but pretty much everything that I do. Um, so I'd probably pop that out a little bit and you know, kind of move it around so I have you know, both information on the same screen. So I've designed stage two, and I want the predecessor of that to be designed stage one. So from that task view, I'm going to select new predecessor, and I'm going to create a linkage with the design task. So here's my design task right here. The list I'm seeing it matches this list exactly. So I'm going to select my design task create the linkage, and I now have that task dependent upon the next one. I may then want to link the copywriting to the completion of design stage two. So I'm going to add a dependency upon the completion of design stage two. I'm going to choose my copywriting task and create the linkage, and so on and so forth until I'm satisfied. Now, once I've done that, and we look at then the schedule, we notice I'm just refreshing it. 
you're going to see here that we're we're seeing what that structure is. Now, if there was any logic flaws, like if you know one task started before the completion of another and we made them dependent upon each other, uh, that line would be red to let you know that it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but in this case, we're seeing you know, what the relationship is between these items. And I connected three tasks within that same view. So that's something important as well, is that you, know, you can connect multiple items from that same view. Uh, you know, if I wanted to do it with the production, again, I would just select my production here. Again, what I would typically do is, so I, just so I can see it, is I'd pop it out, and then I want my production work to be dependent upon the completion of the copywriting. And I then have that item. I might then want to look at, say, the freelancer. And in order for the freelancer work to be starting, I need to have the original rough draft work done so that the freelancer has the rough drafts to be able to complete the design work from. So it doesn't really matter which order I do it, but I'm going to select the freelancer item, you know, pop that out, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to create a predecessor of the freelancer to be the sketching work. Create the linkage, and that linkage is created. So from there, I can then see the relationship. So I have a nice waterfall going from design, design task two, copywriting to production. I also have the sketches of roughs work related to the freelancer work. So that's how we're you know, building out those dependencies. Now, there are some things that we actually do have coming to this, uh, this view that are going to improve some of the way that you work with it. Uh, for example, we do have some really nice drag and drop functionality uh, that's nearing completion that'll be released in the not too distant future that'll make it so that you don't really have to move away from here to be making changes and adjustments uh, to you know, the dates and things like that. You'll be able to select one of these, one of these bars and drag it and drop it into the different dates that you want. So um, there's some nice functionality coming uh, to that. Uh, I, I actually haven't seen it myself, but I, I do have some colleagues that have, um, and uh, apparently it looks pretty cool. And I was just chatting with uh, the individual that's developing that the other day, and uh, they said it looks pretty cool. So uh, yeah, so we'll be looking forward to seeing that, because I know that's a common question. Uh, you know, if, if people want to make adjustments to dates, they don't want to have to move from this page. So you'll be able to just drag and drop these around the screen. Uh, Sophie, I figured I should check in. Anything that you think we should address on the screen? I can see you kind of typing away there. Uh, looks like you have a bit of a list. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be bothering you, but what, what, what are your thoughts? Hey, yeah, Mark. Ag again, everyone, I'm so sorry. My typing can't keep up with you today. Um, but there, there was a, a good question from Tim. Uh, he was just curious about you know, how we still have the, the bulk edit and the retro Gantt, um, and if those would be removed. Uh, y yes, they, they will be removed in, in the future. It's just uh, while our product team is, is continuing to work on the functionality of this module that, uh, that, that we are leaving it for now. Um, but once we have the functionality in the, in the new schedule grid, as, as well as the Gantt chart, we, we will be able to slowly wean those out. Um, but you know, like, why would anyone not want to look at some of those retro things? Like, we got to remember where we came from, right? I don't know. I don't know about you, Mark. <laughs> you know, I, um, I was actually told that some people actually still use this, this view. Um, and they'll print screen it and, and put it into documents. So, um, you know, it, it was sticking around for, for a few people that do use that. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not sure how long it'll stay. Probably not too long until, you know, People get used to it and, and make the adjustment. In the bulk edit, I was actually chatting with someone the other day who does most of their scheduling from the bulk edit. Uh, so, you know, while that bulk edit functionality isn't in the grid view, because you know you kind of have to go through and and build the schedule as I've done today. Uh, most of the time, I find most things aren't really bulk edited in schedule creation, except for the few things that are, like like statuses um, and perhaps maybe the service dropdown. So you do need to jump back into that bulk edit if you want to adjust the status uh, in bulk. But that's something that uh, you know, you'll see uh, you know, move, moved, uh, moved away from pretty, pretty soon, I think. Um, but right now, I know that uh, there, you know, there's a lot of work being done on the Gantt view, especially that, you know, that interactivity, that drag and drop functionality is something that's uh, you know, coming down the pipeline very soon as well. So you know we've we've created our schedule here, and 
there's a few things that I want to touch on around the fact that it exists and it now might be usable for other things because this is something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, so I'm going to touch on the, the, the topic of templating just for a minute here uh, and how you can then use those templates to do different things. So for example, let's go back to the basic info tab. So we're looking at the schedule. I'm going to jump back to the basic info tab. And from here, and actually, you know, I didn't even really need to do that. I just got into such a habit of it. Um, it really didn't matter which tab I'm on. Uh, but the point of what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make here is that what you need to do is from the top select actions, and you're going to want to select convert to template. Now, when you select convert to template, there are potentially two options that will exist. In this case, it'll only be one. It'll ask us, you know, do we want to convert a copy, or do we want to create this into a template? And in this case, this is part of a real job. There's real work being done here, so we need to convert a copy. Uh, if there was no work being done and we were creating this just for the purpose of it being a template, we wouldn't need to convert a copy. Uh, so I'll select convert a copy to, get, to turn this schedule into a template or copy it into a template for future use. Now that I've done that, there is a few suggestions that I want to make. Any schedule templates you want to give it some sort of generic name. So this might be some sort of like, uh, you know, um, uh, let's just call it uh, grocery savings, brochure, a few different grocery stores. We do brochures them from time to time for um, the different events they might have or seasonal stuff. So that's going to be the name of the template. It's not specific to any one company. So I'm going to blank out the company field. It's not specific to Safeway. It could be for you know, a variety of different clients. It might not always be managed by myself. It might be managed by other individuals in the future. So we're going to blank that out as well. Submit that. And we now have the titles and the information accurate. Regarding the tasks, you'll just want to go through and make sure that anything that's specific to real work is taken out of here. So you know, for example, the freelancer item is referencing Blue Line Digital. You know, we could work with any freelancer in the future. So we're going to delete that out. We're going to save that. And now it's, it's ready to be used again. So we have the schedule here as a template to be used again in the future. The way that you would use that is either by using it to create a job or using it within an existing job. And something that I see sometimes from some more advanced users is using the schedule template as a way of creating an estimate and a job and pricing out the work. So for example, I might choose to add a schedule for let's just say our client here uh, Pro Foods Distribution. And I'm going to use our new template. So I'm going to use this grocery savings brochure template. I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call it uh, you know, Pro Foods Brochure. Fill in the description, any other information that I want to, submit that. And we now have a schedule that's filled in with all of our information. But let's say that today, you know, it's it's we're not in September. Uh, it's actually October. So, you know, it's somewhere early to mid-October. The dates are old, so we need to adjust the dates. So the way that I'm going to do that is go into my bulk edit, and I'm going to choose to adjust the dates. And we'll say that we're not starting this, you know, in September. We're starting it, let's say, in October, about a month from now. Adjust that, and all the dates move forward an equal amount of time. I'll say just in this case that all the staff people are still relevant and the same and that's all fine. The hours are the same. Everything's good there. You know, so I'm, I'm ready to, to work with this schedule. And from here up at the top, I'm going to select to add estimate and job. When I select that, it's going to give me some options for how I then price out the work. And by default, it's just going to use you know, the information you've put in, the different hours across the different services, to price out the work. So you usually don't need to make any adjustments there. Uh, we'll select our estimate type, enter our due date, we'll say this will need to be done by you know, late November, submit that, and it generates an estimate with the value that's based on the information that we had. Notice it automatically built in an estimate for $6,000. I can add in any external expenses that I need, but I've used my schedule to build out the estimate price as it pulled in the hours that I entered in my schedule. So that's a neat way of working. I've seen some people do it very, very successfully, uh, and it can add to the accuracy of your, of your estimating 
as you continue forward uh, and you can and you do it more consistently. Uh, so I, I'd recommend checking that out. Um, you know, potentially trying to build out some estimates based on the schedule details. Uh, it's a good way to price work that sometimes can be a bit more realistic and a bit more accurate. So for the last 10 minutes here, I want to talk just a little bit about task management uh, and just looking at the different tasks that are assigned to the individuals after you've assigned them. So you know, we, we've created a job, we've created our schedule, and we have our tasks here. So we see all of our different tasks. We can see our schedule and everything's been assigned. One thing you might want to do is you may want to look at your dashboard and some different information you have in your dashboard to manage task lists. So, you know, for example, if you give the tasks and to-dos panel more screen real estate in your dashboard, then you'll be able to see more information. You'll also be able to bulk select individuals. I actually spoke with somebody recently who didn't, didn't know that you could do this, but if I just hold Command or Shift or Control if you're on a PC, I can bulk select individuals. If I want to see everything that my design team is working on, and or let's just say with just my design team for now. Select that, and I'm now looking at a list of all the tasks that my design team is working on. From there, uh, you know, I have it sorted by due date, but maybe I want to narrow it down a little bit. Now, I was just speaking with my client, Great Atlantic Insurance, and they're asking me how their work is going. So I'm going to narrow this down to just my clients, Great Atlantic. Type in the information, whether it's the company name, code, description, task title, whatever it is, it'll narrow it down. So I'm now looking at all the tasks assigned to my design team that are open, that are related to my clients, Great Atlantic Insurance. Notice I'm only seeing Great Atlantic Insurance. So we don't have anything that's overdue for them, but we do have a production task that's due on the 10th that still has 14 hours left in the budget. You know, this is you know, being done by Jimmy. Most likely this might be, end up being overdue uh, if he can't, you know, get it done by the 10th, which is, you know, coming right up. So, you know, that might be an item where I'll tell my client, hey, you know, this production task is going to be late. We can also see our task time summary if you happen to throw it into a dashboard where we're seeing, you know, a bit of an overview of what's going on. So we have 132 open tasks. 40 of them are due in the next seven days. 15 of them are overdue. 6% of my tasks, which equals 8 of them, are over budget. And 5%, which equals 7, are over 80% of budget, but still haven't gone over that 100% point yet. Now, if I want to see, okay, well, which of, you know, I have 40 tasks that are due in the next 7 days. You know, what are they? What's going on with them? I can select this, and it will bring me to the list of tasks that make up that data point. See, so here I have the 40 tasks that are on the go that are due within the next seven days. From here, there's a variety of different things that I can do, but I might want to produce you know, some sort of report. I want a report showing me you know, what these tasks are, what's their description, who's working on them, what do they do, and I might want to you know, take out some of the information here that I don't need. So I'm going to choose to you know, manage my columns and take out some of the information that may not be important to me. So I don't care about the due time, for example. I'll get rid of maybe some of these other aspects. We'll leave the service. Take out, I will leave by. But I'm going to add in description. I'm going to move description over beside the name. And then I'm going to move the service. Actually, we'll take the service right out. It's not relevant to this information. I'm going to move due date over beside status. Save that. And we have then a list of data with the information that we want. And there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of people don't really like using initials. So I'm going to enter you know, two names and just put that beside the initials. I'll move by over to the left of that, and then I have you know full names. That's something that I've heard you know people ask about. It's something you can do, so I can see you know, the full name instead of just the initials of the person. And then I can produce my PDF report. And then I have a list of all the tasks that are on the go, you know, coming up in the next uh, seven days that are currently open. 
with the information that I've asked for. The last thing that I want to show here is around the resource allocation and just a little bit of an understanding of that. Uh, in fact, let me back up and show you where I'm accessing this. Uh, if we go under tasks and select resource link, then we can look and see you know, what kind of availability do we have. Now what this is showing us here is the individual and their work schedule. Gray time is unallocated or free time. The number is how many hours they have yet unallocated. Green is acceptable allocation. Time has been booked that's okay. And red is over allocated time. So we can see here that Jimmy's pretty underbooked, whereas Darren's about a half hour overbooked every single day for the next two weeks. If I want to see what, you know, what's making up this time, what's he working on today, I can select this and it will show me a list of the tasks that are making up that time. So in this case, I have a couple tasks that have, you know, uh, a bunch of time still left in them that are, you know, coming up that are due in a couple weeks and that time spreading back to today. I might say, okay, well, I'm going to move this phase three item, you know, from Darren down to Jimmy, submit that, and it moves the task from one individual to the other. So he's no longer so overbooked. Now this will put the time, you know, the allocation uh, based on the start and the end dates. So, you know, if something starts today uh, and it's due in two weeks from now, it'll move the time uh, to two weeks from now and then pull it backwards so that it's not, you know, building up the time that you have available today. Uh, you know, if somebody has eight hours that's due for them in three weeks, it'll show up in three weeks so that you can see that they have you know, three weeks of unbooked time that isn't, you know, they don't have to have that eight hours done necessarily today. Uh, so that's how that, that, al that allocates, if you're you know, curious about how that works. So I think we have uh, enough time for a few more questions. So if I, I can see you're kind of still going away there. Anything that you think I should, uh, so so laughing, it looks like there's, um, there's a, lot, a lot of stuff coming in, but anything that you think we should address? Uh yeah, actually, um, the, I think about five separate people have asked this one. Uh, if the Gantt is printable, you know, there isn't really a print button on it. Um, you know, what I'd recommend doing is probably print screening it. Move back to one here. There isn't really a, a print button for the Gantt chart. There is a print button up at the top here, um, but it is uh, more like a PDF. Um, so we're going to see, well, it is a PDF. So we're going to see, you know, the, the details in the list view. Uh, if you did want to print it, you know, something that I recommend doing is, is probably print screening it. Uh, so I, you know, kind of pull this out here. I then have my entire schedule, and I'm just going to select that. In fact, I probably want to include my due dates. I then have, you know, my image, and I can drop it into a report or something else if I want to. Um, I, I do know that a product is planning on making this printable in, in the near future, though. I, I think they're just still working on uh, some of the functionality behind it all before they they actually go and allow you to start printing things. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, though, Mark. I think I think that you're right. I have, I've been more hearing about um, you know, interactive Gantt, but I know that we've had some questions around printing the Gantt, so um, we'll see what comes first. Um, not too sure, but I, I know I've been hearing a bit more about the kind of the drag and drop functionality, but it could be printing is, is might be first up. I'm not sure, but I guess we'll find out pretty soon. Any other questions that you think that we should address here in the last couple minutes that we have? That we have? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with everyone. There have been a lot of really great questions, and, and I think probably the best way to tackle them all will actually be me following up with you outside of this webinar. Um, I, I still have about 20 questions actually that I, I haven't been able to address yet. So, you know, I, everyone, I, I, I really hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and, and I'll be following up with everyone on everything just so you're not having to stay on the, the go-to webinar control panel to, to get your responses. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we appreciate everyone taking the time and all of your, you know, uh, taking the time for, check the, for checking this out and then of course for, for providing uh, the questions. We really do appreciate uh, you know, your time and your efforts uh, in, you know, making the system work for your agency. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to close the webinar down in just a little bit. So please, uh, you know, if you have questions, get them in. Uh, and then, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, probably get some, get some assistance for Sophie here. So it's not just yourself answering those. Uh, and then we'll get some responses back 
uh, to everyone as soon as we can. Uh, and then as per usual, two weeks from today, alerts and permissions webinar, uh, same bad time, same bad channel. So, uh, so please do log in to check it out, register uh, so that uh, we know you're coming. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, if you do have any feedback for the webinars and or if you have any requests for future topics or anything like that, uh, please do feel free, feel free to email that information to success at functionpoint.com. Again, that's success at functionpoint.com. That'll go to a few of us here. Uh, we do appreciate your feedback, so do please feel free to provide it. Um, but otherwise, I think that's about it. Uh, Sophie, anything I'm forgetting today? No, I... Uh... I don't think so. As as always, Mark, it was a pleasure listening to your voice talk about schedules. And um, everyone, this probably will take me some time. Probably by the end of Friday, you should have all of your responses. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll give we'll we're going to make sure to get so some assistance on uh, on answering those questions, and we'll have those answers as you mentioned. Uh, you know, sometime by the end of the week, uh, you'll get you'll get some responses on each of those. So, you know, uh, thank you again, everyone, for your interest. We really do appreciate it, and looking forward to. Um, you know, uh, you know, seeing everyone logged in next week. So uh, thanks again, and have yourselves a great rest of your Wednesday. We'll